Hello everyone, I'm Karen Foley and we're here at the Calabasas Library for Authors Night. We have two guests and it's a mother-daughter, two talented, lovely ladies, Farhana and Menaz Sahibzada. Mm -hmm. One and off, both authors, one for cooking and one in poetry. And live locally here in uh, Woodland Hills and you live in Sherman Oaks? Mm -hmm. Perfect. Let's do the cookbook first. Both are very close to my heart, eating and poetry, mm -hmm. both of which I love. Who did the book, Flavorful Shortcuts to Indian slash Pakistani Cookbooks. Because they really are the same cooking, more or less. Wouldn't yes. you say? Very true. It was the same country originally. There you go. And I get I, this question asked of me so often during my cooking classes and, uh, you know, at other events that I attend, uh, then people are always curious to know the differences. But you have absolutely pointed out the correct, uh, you know, kind of nailed it. Uh, they were the same countries. So the cuisine has a lot of similarity. There are differences, but, you know, those differences are more uh, uh, geographical, maybe economic and maybe social, but, uh, and they are probably in my guess, the same differences, you know, that existed before the countries were divided. Or right, here in, in the United States, our Southern cooking is regionally different. The way they might cook fried chicken, exactly. or the way we would cook chicken here right. in the West. That's true. Now, where were you born? I was born in Karachi. Right, in Pakistan. In Pakistan. Okay. I was born in Karachi in Pakistan and uh, I was raised mostly in Punjab. And uh, a lot of the food that I cover in my cookbook is the northern food. It's the food of Punjab and uh, a lot of, uh, which is northern Indian also. So there would be a lot of similarity between the food of New Delhi and Lahore. Uh, Were your likely. family uh, all cooks or chefs? You know, um, my mother was an artist. Ah. Oh. And as an artist, she was interested in the creative, everything creative, and she had a great hand at cooking. But here is the reality of the socioeconomic structure of India and Pakistan. See, in, in the socioeconomic structure of India and Pakistan, almost a majority of the middle class homes, you would say, and, uh, you know, and, and above, would have somebody to cook your daily meals. Yes. You know, having domestic help is so common over there that if the lady of the house or uh, the gentleman of the house, they, you know, get involved in cooking, it's only because they love it as a hobby and they have a gift they were born with. So my mom was definitely born with that gift. And, uh, but, uh, you know, she was mostly a social worker in her life and uh, she was a teacher at one time and uh, but cooking was her passion do you do any artwork uh, you know i'm glad you asked me that <laughs> I, I that was one uh, trait i definitely picked up from her i don't know if i am come close to what she was doing but i enjoy watercolor she did a lot of oil color and uh, i do a lot of watercolor and when i got married and started to have a family you know what happened was that the responsibilities of a family didn't leave too much time for that creative outlet. But, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the kind of role of, you know, taking care of the family meals, you know, uh, fell on me. And one day I discovered, my God, this is so creative. It's so much fun to cook. And I was just so thrilled to find the same creative outlet. And I said, you know what, watercolor can wait. This is so much fun. But it's also creative in its artistic presentation. A lot of, the, I mean, when you look at a meal, uh -huh. it's how it's presented and how beautiful it appears on the plate. And honestly, that is part of the fun, to make it look beautiful. When you present it to family, friends, that's part of the joy. And my real love and real interest in cooking started with actually desserts. Ah, oh, well, that's my favorite. Yeah, you know, you talk about <laughs> a, a, a creative, beautiful ending, you know. And uh, in those days, it was a lot of self-learning 
we didn't have these amazing networks that would teach us the tricks and the share all their you know secrets uh, you know so i was just started you know got myself immersed into cookbook after cookbook and my challenge always was goal always was was how to you know just kind of find that next masterpiece for my next party you know and see how good a job i could do with that and honestly it it just that's just amazing european american you know french desserts and that was actually a palette left in india and pakistan by the british so we have some of the finest pastry shops in pakistan so that interest you know is there for a reason you know and um, as soon as i discovered that my god i was just uh, uh, you know very much can kind i of immersed in that and then i started teaching cooking and when i started teaching cooking i i opened a cafe and uh, didn't you have a cafe in pakistan or the one here over here ah i opened a cafe and uh, i had planned to incorporate cooking classes over there in as part of the operation of the cafe and uh, but of course i was doing it right here in woodland hills and an easier sell for my cooking classes in america was going to be indian and pakistani food uh, that was my thought process what was the name of your the cafe it was cinnamon sticks ah it was like a cappuccino cafe yes okay and uh, you know my husband always uh, wanted us to have a business he was he's a physician but he was very intrigued in having a business so you know i had listened to it over the years so many times from him and uh, i said well he has this des- real desire for us to have a business i said look we can do a business it has to be something that i enjoy so a few things on the list were out you know and uh, create something creative like food was going to going to be kind of exciting for me you know so what i did was i started i opened it as a cappuccino cafe and see a few day few years before that before we opened the cafe we had lived in saudi arabia for a while that was in the 80s early 80s with your daughter with with, with both daughters mm-hmm. yes we thought it would be an exciting experience for them we were in california and my husband brought up the option he said well i have this opportunity coming up how about if we move to saudi arabia we'll be close to pakistan that's where we are from and uh, you love to travel so this opportunity is going to give us a lot of time uh, and opportunities for travel as well and it'll be good for us it'll be great for the kids so why don't we go along with this option so i i was kind of reluctant with the idea in the beginning uh, you know i'm a little bit of a free soul and america spoiled me even more you know so i was scared of the confinement that might that you know being in that atmosphere might bring uh but uh, the adventure was there so i said okay let's 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 do this and in saudi arabia and it turned out i was i you know had a great time over there didn't feel confined in the way i was scared i might and uh, it was just a blast over there and i we we saw i saw a lot of cappuccino houses over there and at that time i thought you know america is a country of coffee drinkers so when i thought of a business food related business i automatically thought of a coffee house and i incorporated indian and pakistani snacks appetizers meals sandwiches and created menu uh, i wanted the cafe to be different so that's how i designed it so you went from saudi arabia here or did you take another country in before you settled in the united states we were actually in california Oh. We were living in California when this opportunity for Saudi Arabia oh. came along. What made you move to California? You have two daughters, does the other one cook or write poetry? Uh she is she's a dentist. Ah, okay. And uh to my surprise she's getting into cooking somewhat. She is see when I when I wrote the book I uh, my recipes have had the you know the opportunity to be tested in a lot of settings in the schools where I teach. uh the arts institute for example example southern california culinary institute these students are enrolled in cooking classes so those were some of the testing grounds and my classes that i teach 
at uh, Whole Foods or, uh, you know, get, And you teach here in Calabasas as well. I teach here in Calabasas also. So I had, in, I had, uh, had a lot of students, a lot of friends, including my daughter Menaz and, uh, you know, and Noreen I, and some of their friends. I said, you're going to be my test chefs. So I'm getting response from everyone, but from my youngest one. But uh, one day I did get a response. She said, Mom. I, so that was actually a very valuable response to me in some ways. For somebody who was not too much into cooking, tried the, some recipes, and she was so excited with the results that she got that she sent me a text message the next day. She said, Mom, we tried uh, aloo gobi from your book, and we tried this recipe from the book and uh, your directions were easy to follow and the food came out so good. So getting feedback from all different sources, people that are very much into cooking, and especially people that are not that much into cooking, that really gives you that feeling of confidence that you know what, your content and directions and whatever you, your, your book is kind of hitting its mark. That's what I wanted to happen, that people that have never cooked, either never cooked or have never tried Indian before. I wanted to simplify my directions and uh, simplify the recipes so that people would have success at their very first attempt. Well, when we come back from our break, we'll go into the book okay. and describe some of the recipes and some of the categories and the differences between, the subtle differences between Indian and Pakistani cooking. So stick with us and we'll come back in a few minutes. Keep your family safe. Improve your gas mileage. Extend the life of your tires. How do you do it? It's easy. Just check it. Your tire pressure, that is. Keeping your tires properly inflated protects the environment, gives you peace of mind, and saves you money for more important things. So just check it once a month. A message from CalRecycle. Welcome back to Authors' Night with our two guests, Farhana and Menaz. Before we go into your book, okay. since your daughter, a very talented woman, who is an English teacher. That's right, yeah. And a poet, has a wonderful poem that I particularly liked and noted that I wanted to hear uh -huh. spoken, is about food. Okay. It's called A Second Eulogy. If you wouldn't mind reading, I love the poetry. I'm a very big poet fan, poetry fan. Okay. So a second you, eulogy? Yes. Okay, a second eulogy. It was the saddest slice of banana cream pie because it tasted so good. Just the right amount of salt and sweetness. We ate slowly after dinner, asked the waitress for coffee too, decaf because it was almost 10, because it was the last day of winter break. We talked about our plans for summer, but like teenagers discussing retirement, our voices did not carry sun. Instead, our forks dug eagerly into mirth. This is whipped cream as it should be, my husband said. The outer edge was layered with bananas. Every bite was a quick death, the end of something only beginning. We finished our pies down to the crust, our hands reluctant to let go of the forks. When I die, I said, pointing at the crumbs on my plate, bury me in these. My husband nodded. I pictured my desk at work buried in papers, six months of post-its signaling my fate. Had I worn sweats, I might have ordered another slice. One didn't feel enough, was like a spotlight on a tomb. But that night, I couldn't make room for a second eulogy. There you go. Do you eat, eat your mother's desserts like this? Like a banana, did your mother make banana cream pie? She hasn't made banana cream pie recently, oh. but she has made apple pie, which I had a couple of weeks ago, and it was amazing. But I will definitely say that my love for desserts is linked to her cooking growing up. I remember, especially when we were living in Saudi Arabia, as she talked about, my mom got into making cakes and decorating cakes. And they were very artistic. And, you know, she has a background in art. And I know that that was a time, I think, of when my love for cakes and pies started. And I think that particular occasion was 
at Mary Callender's restaurant that I was writing about. But in a way, it's about all of those, you know, all of those moments growing up where I just almost greedily ate. I, I, I'm a big eater. I love to eat. So. Aren't we all? Yeah. <laughs> But I read every one of your poems, and I was in the thrall of the book. Mm -hmm. I really love them. That's why I Thank picked you. out a couple of particular interests to me. Now, you were born in Pakistan, correct? Yeah, I was born in Lahore. And then you moved out here when you were how old? About a month after we moved back to the States. I, mean, I guess my parents were already living here, so I moved out. And I grew up mostly in Southern California except for the years we lived in Saudi Arabia. Do you go back at I, all? I did while we were growing up. We went back pretty often, almost every year or two, for like the summer or over winter break. But I haven't been back now since 1998. So it's been a really long time. Now you have a lot of awards for poetry. I was very impressed by them. Let me get them out. I don't want to overlook any of them. The Penn USA Award, Emerging Voices, Fellow in Poetry, and you write short stories as well? I have written a few short stories. It's mainly The Alphabet poetry. Workshop was in an Ellery Queen magazine. The Alphabet Workbook, yeah. Was when Ellery did you Queen. start writing? I started writing in middle school. I had an English teacher in eighth grade who made us keep this year-long notebook and we could write diary entries in it, or short stories, descriptions, whatever. And I started writing poetry in the journal. And she would really encourage my writing. And I think that was really important to me. She was my first audience, really, and gave me a lot of positive feedback on the poetry. And then I continued through high school and college and through my 20s. And then towards like my late 20s, I got interested in you know, getting some of the work out there or maybe typing it up or thinking more critically about the artistry of writing poetry. It takes a lot to put yourself out yeah, in it print. It does. And have everyone know your soul. Well, but it's the same thing in cooking, but you don't have to see the reactions necessarily. Right. You, you don't have to put your secrets down in your heart as much as you do in poetry. The good things, the bad things, mm -hmm. the meaningful things. Yeah, it's definitely created some shift in my work, having some of it published now and out there because I had it hidden in boxes for a really long time. And I think there was always an imagined audience, but still having it out there, you get a sense of what people respond to and having done public readings, you get a sense of how putting in a little humor, for instance, would be interesting. And I think that's been one of the shifts since I started to publish the work and participate in public readings is that it's become a little more audience oriented. How often do you write? I write, these days I've been writing every day. National Poetry Month for Napa Remo. Do you but go home and eat your mother's cooking? I do, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Pretty often do you on the did weekends. Did you read her book? I did read her book, yeah I did. And I think it was really meaningful for me that she put this together because in some ways I see a connection between recipe writing and poetry writing. What is that? Right. There, I mean, well, if you think about like the list of ingredients, right, there's a kind of organization to it. Yeah, like it's very specific, but it's also visually very similar to a poem, like with line breaks. And then there's some like discussion of it. And it's meant for consumption. Right? Interesting. You know, I think there's some commonality there. Do you see it the same way? Now that she brings it up, yeah. <laughs> it's kind of an interesting, you know, sort of an analogy of the two, you know. And I was just thinking, I can think of perhaps one difference in the Indian versus Pakistani is that the Pakistani would serve beef. Yes. But the Indians are respect the, the cows and they would not eat beef. Well, in, yes, as you said, Indian, you know, that would be a religious difference, maybe a social difference connected to the religious difference. Their religion dictates mainly in India, 80% of the people would predominantly be vegetarians because they, they are very strict. Some will not even have an egg. So a strict vegetarian would refrain from 
all meat and things coming from meat. Uh, and, but in Pakistan, uh, you know, your religious take is different and there are uh, restrictions to some meat like, uh, you know, maybe ham or pork, but uh, all other meats are permitted. Uh, your standard lamb, you know, beef and chicken. So that is the reason the handling of recipes in both countries, if you see, if you talk about the difference today, what may have transpired since partition, it would be predominantly that. Chefs in India would be really a, quite a bit more skilled in handling of vegetable dishes and I learn a lot from them. I go to restaurants over here, if I want to get an Indian version and I know I am at the right place because they are going to show me something that I did not know before and sure enough so many times they do. And But if you want to go to meat cooking, go to a Pakistani restaurant if you want to try something good in meat, you know or a Pakistani home because their experience would be so much deeper in handling meat and those are some of the differences. But you've divided the book or put different chapters. What You have a vegetarian section, then there's meat cooking and then there's fowl, poultry. Yes, for the ease of use of course, you know, somebody and wants to go into vegetables or you know or they want to look at grilled cooking. And desserts. Oh, and desserts. Forget the desserts. And barbecuing. Barbecuing, absolutely. In summer, I do a barbecue class, you know, and uh, uh, where I quite often try to invite a local restaurant to bring their tandoor over. And I've been able to pull it off in quite a few classes. So you have somebody who's working along with me. I'm showing the same recipe on the grill or even in a toaster oven. And whereas a gentleman coming in from a local restaurant, he will bring his tandoor over and show the same recipe cooked in the tandoor to kind of demonstrate the differences. I think it's important for our audience to know that you work through our Department of Recreation and Parks. I, and, yes. And that's where you do the cooking for Calabasas. Yes, I, I, we had this conversation with them very recently at De Enzo Park. And uh, I was very curious to see how it would be go over there, and I, I was I was excited actually to do it. So we scheduled uh, in the last quarter a couple of classes, and uh, they were very happy with how they went. And now we have quite a few more coming in this next quarter. And I, I understand a lot of people are afraid of the cooking because they feel it might be too spicy. Uh -huh. Is that true? Well, I was. Uh, doing a class one time and I said, what is the myth about Pakistani Indian food? And uh, this young kid was there and he said, it's spicy. And I said, okay, what's the reality? He said, it's flavorful. <laughs> and uh, I was discussing it with my daughter Manaz one time and she kind of elaborated that. I said, how does it come to you? And uh, she, exactly what she said, you know, this kid said in the class, yes, and that is exactly what I'm trying to bring out in my classes that these spices you can there's a lot of flexibility in Indian and Pakistani cooking you can adjust the spices you can go overboard with them but you can adjust them to your palate and the only spice that gives it heat or makes it hot is your cayenne pepper so in so many of the recipes I'll use crushed red pepper because that gives you a little bit more control and if you put a little bit less of cayenne pepper uh, you know, you can adjust the intensity of the dish according to your own palate. So it's uh, unlike baking where you have to go with exact measures, uh, Pakistani Indian cooking gives you a lot of room for uh, adjusting it to your taste. So you know that uh, actually when Manaz first left for college and uh, she would call me and asking about different recipes and her favorite is aloo, aloo spinach and potatoes. And uh, I remember her asking me, and the question continued to come up in my classes also. Uh, if she would find a cookbook, she would run the ingredients by me and uh, talk about the directions and all of that. And I would, I would kind of tell her, no, forget about this ingredient. You don't need that. You don't need that. Simplify it. Because sometimes she would sound, you know, kind of overwhelmed with a lot of ingredients listed in the recipe. And uh, I saw the same thing in my cooking classes and I, 
uh, that was another thing I wanted to do. You know what? It's so simple. Let's not complicate it. Less is more over here, you know, and just make it easy on ourselves. Sometimes I would hear stories in the classes. Uh, somebody would come very excited. You know, I was trying to cook a dessert and it called for rose water and her neighbor, Indian or Pakistani, I advised her to go to the garden, pick up some roses and make her own rose water. And I looked, I said, I'm tired hearing about it. So <laughs> let's keep it simple, you know. <laughs> you don't need to do that. Go, go to, to the, the store. store. I, care, I keep rose water in the house constantly. Thank you so much. I use it for the skin. Ah, <laughs> yes. And now... I see, put it for a cold drink. It's t it is, isn't dessert. it refreshing? That, Instead amazing. of regular water when you're yes. making a dessert, a little rose water. Honestly, sometimes I put a little, very careful amount in a in a almond lassi, and it just gives it a new life. You know, it just my God. You know, you just have to know, get used to the quantities. That's all, and uh, just keep it very simple, and and uh, you know, it's uh, it's not that complicated. Actually, spices are your preservatives, and you know, they help you in so many different ways. Well, we'll come back to that and Wonderful. we'll do a recipe or two and another poem. So stick with us for another quick break. Global warming is a problem. Sound the alarm! We think it's an important thing to save energy. To protect the environment. To protect the future. Every Who in Whoville makes a difference. We need everyone! We Together? Together. Together. We can all make this. Save energy with Energy Star, and then you can be our solution. Yeah! Go to energystar.gov forward slash kids to see what else you can do. We're back for Authors Night, and during our break, I was mentioning to Manaz that I loved the poem Desi Noir. So if you wouldn't mind reading that to us. Where, where did you write this? When did you write this? I wrote this poem maybe three or four years ago. I was taking a workshop through UCLA Extension called Poetry Goes to the Movies, um, writing the noir poem with Suzanne Lummis. She's a local poet. And so we watched some old noir films like Pick Up on South Street, LA Confidential. And I thought it'd be kind of interesting to write about a South Asian femme fatale. And I chose a wedding as the setting. So that's how this poem came. Okay, Desi Noir. She wasn't the childbearing type, even in her off-white sari with silver embroidery, offering glasses of lussy lined on a tray, making small talk with the aunties. Yes, I've been putting almond oil in my hair, and no, I don't plan to visit Lahore this winter. Her lips narrowed when she smiled. She may have been 22 or younger. She may have been a schoolgirl once, storing her pencils in a case, sharpening each to a point, writing inside the margins of the page. But tonight, the wedding bubbling with cups of chai, she was a silhouette winking at the groom when the bride wasn't looking. After dinner, she disappeared into the back garden for a smoke. Sometimes she'd peer up at the sky suddenly, as though rattled by sounds of guns in the distance. Her eyes were cloudy, a hookah lounge for drifters. Her gaze feathered past the hills, reading the Los Angeles streetlights, the lampposts blinking gold and silver. The city could be a closed book, but she was hiding in the open, using the moon of her palm to smooth out wrinkles in her drape. Moments later, she saved a leaf from falling to the ground, holding it inches from her face, as if it were a flame to the cold. What are you working on now? Are you working on another book? Are you working on a story? Are you working on poetry? I'm working on poetry. So Tongue Tai, this collection, is a chapbook, which is considered to be like a half book of poetry. And it's something that someone might publish on the way to publishing a full-length manuscript. So I'm working on my full-length manuscript right now, which would include many of these poems and some additional poems. And I'm revising it, structuring it, restructuring it. And I've been working on a new series of poems as well which kind of are actually in the mood of Desi Noir, this poem I just read, a darker kind of mood. I read a lot of mystery fiction, so they're kind of crime poems. 
I don't know how to how else to describe them, but they kind of respond to crime stories in the news. I watch a lot of Law and Order, Damages mm -hmm. kinds of shows. Respond to scenes in that. Is that where you get your ideas? Yeah, in part, especially these days. I think I usually tend to get my ideas from my obsessions, and I'm obsessed with mysteries right now. So, yeah. Obsessions are fine. Yeah. <laughs> and look, if you can create something like Tongue Tied with all these beautiful poems, I read one each night. Uh, I mean, what better thing to go to sleep with? Some good food sure. in your stomach and a great poem Absolutely. to get you through the evening. All right. So you have all these plans. That's wonderful that you can fit them in a busy schedule of teaching and everything else. I know. I think that's one of the reasons why I work in fragments and poetry, because I teach full time. So I have a lot of essays to grade. It's high school. It's um, really intense kind of schedule working with the students. So working on a short piece kind of works with that kind of you know, schedule really well. Where can someone get your book? You can go to the Finishing Line Press website, that's the publisher of the chapbook, or go to Amazon, or go to my blog. And if you well, Google you have my yeah, if you Google my name, Manas Sahibzada, then you'll find the blog right away. We'll put all that on the screen. Now, what about your book? Because it looked, I will not want to say simple, so people will think they're getting simplistic recipes, but easy to follow. Uh huh. And complete uh -huh. meals. Right. Right. Uh, the book is now available, it's on Kindle and it's also on Amazon.com and uh, some of the local stores are carrying it and I'm selling it through Whole Foods and it should be in Gelson's uh, within the next couple of months and a lot of local stores. Do you have another book in the making? Yes, I have uh, on occasion, you know, toyed around with the idea. Uh, sometimes a title comes to my mind and I'll kind of jot it down. One of the things that I have been asked to write about is just strictly a vegetarian cookbook. I'm, you know, kind of working on that and uh, thinking about that. Then I wanted another option in my mind was about uh, soft drinks and maybe appetizers with an Indian I, like smooth lassies and all that, you know, with an Indian twist. And uh, also, uh, my husband and I have been toying around with the idea of writing a book uh, with a nutrition angle. Him being a physician, he has always been my uh, source to go to for nutritional information. And, uh, uh, you know, he's, uh, it was kind of, Took a little time to kind of convince him and kind of reel him in, but looks like he's kind of ready for the idea. <laughs> and uh, now he talks about it with, with talks about it with excitement. So I think I got him now. You know. What a sense of pride he must have with three women in his family, all talented and lovely. Oh, you're so kind. I appreciate it. Thank he's you. a blessed man. <laughs> he's a very nice guy. Well, I hope that our audience will try the cookbook and look at the cookbook because they're easy to follow recipes. They're just look beautiful and Thank they're so well much. presented and it's, it's a great change in a meal. I'm glad to see your cooking classes are successful and that your poems are so well received Thank because you. it's a pleasure to have met both of you and I want to thank you both for coming and gracing our program. Do, do, do honor to our city by coming and being part of our Authors' Night. Thank you thank so much you. for having us. Thank Appreciate you. it so much. It is our pleasure, and I want to thank the Media Operations Department, the City of Calabasas, and the Calabasas Library. And thank you, our audience, for joining us today on Authors' Night. <laughs>